Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the place where we talk about that most wonderful of all fictional genres and also a stylistic statement, steampunk. And of course history, because what steampunk is, is the intersection of history with science fiction. Now, because of that I'm interested in anything that's even vaguely historical and especially, you know, popular works of art and so on. When the musical Hamilton came out, I was kind of kind of intrigued and didn't get to see it because it was a very expensive and it took a while for it to get out here to the hinterlands. But finally it came on to Disney Plus, so I was able to watch it. In fact, I watched it twice. So the name of this video is A Deplorable Reviews Hamilton. And a deplorable, that's me. Uh, because Way back when, if you call Hillary Clinton's infamous basket of deplorable speech when she uh, slammed everybody who didn't back her bid for the presidency, and a lot of us adopted that term as a badge of honor, and I still wear it proudly today. So, the point of this is that most of the people who loved Hamilton so much, you know, were progressives, establishment types, the kind of types who had politics that were close to the creator of the show, Lin-Manuel Miranda. And I'm a person whose politics and whose viewpoint are quite a bit different. So I thought it might be interesting to do this from the perspective of someone who had a little bit different political viewpoint. When the show first came out in 2015, one of the reservations I had was how much hype it was getting. It was, it was crazy, celebrated by everybody. You know, we got 11 Tony Awards, Grammy Award, all these nominations. They performed in the Obama White House, and the, you know it's so celebrated. The tickets were super expensive, and I thought I can't live possibly live up to the hype because a lot of these things. The only reason is that the critics love them so much is either the the politics of the creator, or the politics they're trying trying to push in in the work uh, lately anyway. So though I suspected that Hamilton may have been overhyped, I also thought that it was a dumb idea. I mean, think about the concept. We're going to do a musical show about the life of Alexander Hamilton, <laughs> and we're going to do it as a musical with hip-hop <laughs> as the fundamental style, and we're going to have most of the actors be black. <laughs> nah, it sounded dumb. But what sounds dumb isn't always dumb in effect. For example, if you recall Moulin Rouge, the 2001 version with Nicole Kidman and Ewan McGregor, I thought that sounded stupid. <laughs> Here's a historical show. It takes place in 1900 Paris. And they decided to do a musical soundtrack of popular songs from the 1970s and 80s. Insane? Perhaps. But it turned out to be a wonderful show. Tons of fun. It wasn't really done that seriously, so that kind of saved it, in my view. Same thing with Hamilton, in the sense that it's a musical. As someone once said, wish I could remember who, uh, musicals are an artificial art form. People don't just stand all around on street corners singing to each other. So that kind of that kind of makes it better as well, because it's it's stylistic, it's impressionistic, it's not supposed to be realistic. Though, though very uh, very ironically. The history it's based on is actually fairly accurate, as far as, as far as I'm aware. In fact, it's based on a book by Ron Chernow from 2004. It won some, won some prizes. It was, it was uh, celebrated, but I, you know, I don't think it was on everybody's lips. And, and, and uh, it so, just so happened that uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda was on vacation and he had this book with him to read. He must be kind of a brainy guy if he reads historical biographies on his vacation. And he thought, wow, this would make a great musical. And not only that, but we'll do it in hip hop. And you either have to be a genius or a little bit crazy, or perhaps some of both, <laughs> to, think, to think that when you, when you uh, encounter such, a, such an idea. Now a little comment on, on the idea of, of a race switching the characters who were in historical fact all white. Normally I disapprove of this kind of 
thing. You know, like when the BBC will do a historical drama and they'll cast Anne Boleyn as a black woman. That's just dumb. <laughs> I swear. I mean, it's like saying, oh, we're going to do a story about Shaka Zulu and we're going to have a white man uh, play the part. And of course, we can't darken his skin because that would be racist. But we're going to have a white man anyway because we're, we're you know, colorblind casting. <laughs> no, no, that wouldn't happen. And uh, therefore, it usually shouldn't happen in historical documents, document, documentaries or fictional dramas. But in the case of Hamilton, I saw it as kind of a statement. And this may just be me, but I felt like it was a conciliatory unifying gesture to say, you know, that American history, this part of American history is all of our history, not just for white people, but it's for everyone. It's a statement you probably couldn't make in the current year, 2021, because there's so much animosity, there's so much division, there's so much demonization of the Founding Fathers. Just because they lived in a different time with different mores, and they, they weren't prescient enough to see what uh, their inheritors, their descendants uh, of, in, of their country, 200 years later, would find offensive <laughs> in retrospect. Now let's go a little bit more into the play itself. And, and because when I actually saw it, I was surprised. I, I liked it. And I liked it for a number of reasons. How, they were, the talent, talent was incredible, all the people that they had in the cast. Uh, including Miranda, he wasn't that bad. For the playwright to be acting is, is pretty impressive. <laughs> Having worked in theater myself, I can really appreciate how difficult it is to write. And I also know it's difficult to act. And it's not a left-wing screen, screed, uh, not, at least not by t today's standards. It's pro-immigrant, of course, because Hamilton was, in a sense, an immigrant. He was, he was born in the Caribbean island of Nevis, which was... Part of, the, part of the British Empire, as was, as was New, New York, the colony of New York, which, in a way, he wasn't necessarily an, an, an immigrant from one country to another at the time. The one thing I thought, the one thing that really bothered me when I heard it was that the actors had le lectured Vice President Pence and his wife from the stage <laughs> about immigration or some other, some other, um, I think some other issue that the, that the left is so fond of. You know, it's fine to disagree. I personally see that as, as low class and an abuse of your platform. It's like when the rock stars, uh, I haven't been to a rock concert in a while, but they used to, sometimes they would pause and lecture you about the environment or <laughs> women's rights or something like that. And I like want to say, excuse me, shut up and perform. We didn't play you for a political lecture. If we would have wanted a political lecture, we would have gone to one. Now, as I said, this is about Alexander Hamilton, one of the founding fathers, and it explores, the play does, explores his exceptional life. Politically, he was not a liberal. I looked up some of the, some of the critiques uh, online, and uh, a few of the, the more progressive leftist types were saying, well, Hamilton was an aristocrat, he was an elitist, he didn't want the common people to vote, he didn't want black people to vote, or whatever. Whatever. <laughs> but that, that, was, that was common at the time. Yeah, there were actually people who were more egalitarian than him. So it was an odd choice for a, to, for a man to be celebrated by today's progressive left. But on the other hand, he did come from the Caribbean, although he was white, white as I am. <laughs> and uh, he was uh, illegitimate, which meant that he had no standing in society and that he had to make his own way, which is admirable. Now, as a libertarian, as a longtime libertarian, uh, we always loved Jefferson. I mean, despite his faults, and uh, disliked Hamilton because he was a centralizer, and he wanted a central bank, which we really, really dislike. You know, and the Fed, as we say. But after seeing Hamilton, I started to investigate Hamilton's real background and life story and found it wasn't so complex. He was not a cartoon villain. There were some some of his accomplishments and viewpoints that I would really celebrate uh, from from my viewpoint. So I, I have to thank uh, Miranda for bringing that to my to my view, to my uh, attention. Hamilton was also a really modern guy in the sense of having a notorious sex scandal. And to his credit, 
he owned up to it. He fessed up. He didn't, you know, try to say he did not have sex with that woman or anything like that, because he did. <laughs> and uh, it kind of ended, ended his political career, which I believe could have come back if not for his untimely death. I'm going to go over this really briefly, because I think, I think a lot of people are familiar with how it goes. And I'm not going to talk about the story so much as what I found exceptional about the show and what I liked and what I didn't like. There's two acts. First act follows the period leading up to and through the Revolutionary War. The second act is after the war up until Hamilton's death. Act one, Hamilton arrives in New York City. He meets Aaron Burr and uh, he studies and becomes a lawyer. He meets the Schuyler sisters, uh, who are um, wealthy, they're heirs to the you know, wealthy Schuyler family, and uh, there's three of them, and he kind of has a hankering, kind of takes a shine to two of them, but of course he can only marry one, and he marries, so he marries Eliza, and uh, Hamilton also joins the cause, the revolutionary cause, as Washington's secretary, even though he'd rather lead troops in the battle. You know, whether, whether he would have been really good at that is another question, you know, is, a, is an unknown question. Second act, uh, it kind of glosses over the period before the, of the Constitutional Convention, and although they do mention that uh, Hamilton was a delegate and that he wrote most of the Federalist Papers, and then it really kicks into gear when Washington is elected the first president, Jefferson returns from France, and there's all the political infighting about the the National Bank, and so on. And there's the affair, which eventually comes back to bite him. And uh, Washington steps down, the uh, Hamilton's son dies tragically, and in a duel, which is kind of ironic. And uh, of course, there's the bit about Aaron Burr <laughs> and uh, Hamilton's fatal duel. So the first thing I'm going to celebrate here about Hamilton is the use of Aaron Burr as a, a primary factor in the show. Played by Leslie Odom Jr., a um, very handsome African-American man, very talented, uh, very unlike how Burr looked. <laughs> and uh, you eventually get used to this as the play goes on. He serves in a lot of places as the narrator, and it, it's kind of parallel to the way they use Judas Iscariot in the classic musical Jesus Christ Superstar as the narrator, using an antagonist. And uh, Burr was a fascinating, Burr was a very fascinating character. In fact, uh, there's a, a notable book about him uh, by Gore Vidal. It was a big hit in the 70s. I think I may go back and read that. Now that duel, uh, you know, referring to Burr, is a recurring theme, and that kind of ties it together like the rug tied together the room in The Big Lebowski. And they've got two two themes, not just one, relating to the duel. First is the phrase, I'm not throwing away my shot, which of course can be an opportunity or a gunshot. <laughs> and uh, throwing away my shot, well, that's something you did if you wanted to be an honorable man and not kill your opponent which seems to make the duel kind of pointless. But nonetheless, the other theme that they went through was the count to ten. Because, of course, in a duel, you count to ten, turn and fire at your opponent. And uh, that is something that even occurred, it was even in French. <laughs> so again and again, but not to the point that it's tiresome. Now, one of my... Uh, one of my anxieties about, uh, one of my misgivings about Hamilton was the fact that I'm not really crazy about hip-hop. Though, when you look at it, when you really see the show, much of the music is jazz, blues, with even a smattering of Baroque harpsichord stuff mixed in there for the period authenticity. So, there's not, it's not, uh, it's not all gangsta-ish. It's, it's accessible for the most part. And though there's, though there's a lot of rapping, I'm not against rap in principle. I'm not against rapping in principle. If you really consider it, rapping has been around for ages, including in country music. Consider, for example, Johnny Cash's uh, hit, 
a boy named Sue. Oh, how that's just talking and, and that's rapping, isn't it? You know, my name is Sue. How do you do? <laughs> and so uh, that that rap element gives uh, gives you an interesting mashup and counterpoint of modern 21st century language and themes with uh, very uh, 18th century concepts. There's a, there's a like there's a debate where, and it's very amusing. There's a debate where Madison and Jefferson are on the other side. They're against the National Bank, and and uh, Hamilton wants it, and they they're singing, "You don't have the votes, uh, uh, you don't have the votes," which is extremely amusing. Another juxtaposition of historical uh, of, his, of historical stuff is when King George appears. He appears twice. And he's he's played by uh, Jonathan Groff. I think the only legitimately white person out of the, in the Broadway cast that that is that is uh, in the Disney version that's online. And uh, although some uh, some of them are mixed race, so they are there are other characters who are fairly fair skinned. But I think he's the only actual white person. <laughs> and he wears the powder wig, and so on. He comes out and. And I, I love his song, and this was Mrs. Desperado's favorite, favorite, favorite part, where he, where he sings like it's a, a, a jilted lover in kind of a British invasion, uh, 1960s pop style. You'll be back, you'll come back to me. And if you don't, I'll kill your friends and family to remind you of my love. <laughs> and the second time he comes out, you know, the Americans have been, have been uh, free, and he's, you know, scolding on them. On, look how hard this is going to be, and uh, what John Adams is going to succeed, uh, succeed uh, George Washington, that mousy little man. <laughs> it was cool, and which brings us to Washington, which brings us to Washington, and Washington is one of my absolute favorite, favorite characters in here, because he's not portrayed as he often or usually is. Uh, people read Washington's letters and they think he's some kind of sniveling aristocrat that was complaining about, you know, funding from the Continental Con Con Congress. When in reality, I think he was a burly he-man. Seriously. And, you know, that's what Christopher Jackson is. He's a burly he-man. He's, he's got a thick neck and he's got a shaved head and he, look like, he looks like he could lead an army, army to battle. Why is that important? Because how could Washington have beat the British, the most powerful army on earth, if he'd not been a he-man, a leader of men. And I like Jackson's act, acting because he's not, only, he's not only tough, but he's also sensitive. His, um, his last musical number, uh, when he stepped on from the presidency, always chokes me up, uh, even when I hear it on the soundtrack. And it's because he's talking about how he loves America and how he thinks you know, how he hopes that the, all this, the blood and sweat and tears, to quote Churchill, <laughs> that they put into this uh, has been for, for some good and that the future generations will take care of it. But now we're going, to, we're going to enjoy the fruits of our labors. He quotes the Bible, everyone shall sit under their own fig, vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid, which I really like. It's a, it's a wonderful verse. I uh, probably butchered it and I think it occurs in more than one place. And not a Bible expert by any means. Uh, by any means, another guy I really, really liked as a cast member from the uh, Broadway version on online is David Diggs, a noted rapper. I'm not familiar with his work, not familiar with any of these people, but he has a charisma. I really like him. I mean, he's got a presence, and uh, he plays Lafayette, the Marquis de Lafayette, in the first act. And uh, Thomas Jefferson in the second, and uh, he's he's uh, he's got this in the first act. He's dancing on a table, or, uh, rapping in this ridiculous French accent. In the second act, he's all swagger as he re as he returns as Jefferson returns from Paris and says, "You know what did I miss?" And and now he's he's expecting to take over. While Hamilton, of course, is saying, "Where were you when we were fighting the revolution? You just can you know consorting with the ladies in." Uh, in Paris, <laughs> let's uh, uh, let's let's move on to another another uh, cast member I really liked was uh, Renee Goldberry, who uh, plays uh, Eliza's sister 
Angelica. And I think she had the most heavenly voice of anybody in the show, even though they were all fantastic. Just something, I think it was a little deeper than, uh, than some of the other, a little richer than some of the other female voices, although they were all fantastic. And of course, she's a very compelling character, a very strong woman. Uh, of course, there was uh, the one who played a ha uh, Hamilton's actual wife, Philippa Sue, uh, as uh, as uh, <laughs> Eliza, <laughs> as Eliza, and she has a huge role and a beautiful voice, but a little bit more of a soprano, you know, a little bit higher, higher voice. And the third, the third Skylar sister, Peggy, who, who I felt a little sorry for her. Like she was always an afterthought. And Peggy, it reminded me of Gilligan's Island theme, where they they say "and the rest" at the end, as if we we really don't care about the professor and Marianne at all. But as it turns out, that same actress plays Maria Reynolds, who was the other woman. She was the the woman who um, got involved with Hamilton to his later downfall, uh, played by the very beautiful Jasmine Cephas Jones. And I loved the number she does uh, where she's imploring, she's re imploring Hamilton for help uh, as a woman down her luck and please help me, sir. And it's a very torchy song, very jazzy. And uh, as it happens, uh, when Hamilton's wife was out of town, and they have this affair, and uh, and uh, Reynolds' worthless scumbag husband <laughs> discovers this and blackmails Hamilton, saying, "Well, as long as as long as you can, you know, pay me, I won't tell your wife, I won't tell the public." For a while, Hamilton is able to keep it quiet. Uh, I like how they get in some uh, jabs at slavery, but again, they don't they don't overdo it. I recently saw a thing online that came out not that long ago uh, where a young lady who had worked at the Schuyler Museum, yes, those Schuylers, <laughs> uh, at, you know, as one of the tour guides, had done a little research and found that, shock of horrors, Hamilton sold slaves, he owned slaves, oh my god, we must hold him accountable. You know, he's been dead for over 200 years. <laughs> Uh, well, not exactly. I looked it up. As an attorney, he did write contracts in which slaves were transferred as property until, of course, they outlawed slavery in New York. And he did inherit, or he was given, two slaves as part of his mother's estate when her, his mother died. However, he never took possession of them, partly because he was illegitimate. Uh, and he really didn't stand to inherit. I like to believe that Hamilton would have immediately freed them, and uh, I think he would have, because he was one of the few founding fathers who not only opposed slavery, but didn't, didn't also advocate immediately shipping all the freed slaves back to Africa. Uh, <laughs> most of them, you know, most of them said, no, they can't live with us, it's, it's not going to work. And so you got a hand in that uh, for, you know, for being pretty progressive for his time. I love the, the character, meeting the character Hercules Mulligan, who I have not heard before. He was an American spy uh, for, uh, during the revolution, and he was played by, uh, <laughs> bear with me, Okirte Onodanawan, a Nigerian actor who's, who's also very interesting. He played uh, James Madison in the second act, in which he's very much the straight man to, to the flamboy in Jefferson, and uh, anyway, if I was to make a restaurant, which I never will, but I would have an Irish pub, and I would call it Hercules Mulligans. There was the incredible list of Eliza's accomplishments after her husband died, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Hamilton, and uh, it was amazing. I mean, she helped raise funds for the funds for the Washington Monument, and she helped created an orphan's home. She did all these wonderful things. She was a take charge woman. A lot of fun things, uh, fun things I learned uh, that, for example, <laughs> Hamilton was, had such a, rep a reputation as a woman, uh, womanizer that Martha Washington supposedly named a feral tomcat after him. 
The cat-related website, Chairman Meow, says that this may very well be true, although there's no proof. Martha Washington did love cats, and uh, Hamilton was notorious. As, fact, as a matter of fact, uh, John Adams' wife, Abigail Adams, said, he is lasciviousness itself. <laughs> she didn't like him very much, did she? Uh, and, and there was also the, the tragedy in Hamilton's life. I didn't know about uh, his son, Philip, dying in a duel. Very dumb thing to do. but And that was played by Anthony Ramos, uh, so who, who does a pretty interesting job of, of playing a, 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 in, in Parks, he plays a nine-year-old, which is funny. There's very few stuff I don't, very few elements I don't like. Uh, one example, uh, Miranda's singing isn't quite as good as the rest. I'm being pretty picky here. Uh, and, you know, that's just by comparison with the fantastic voices. Uh, he uh, he is, uh, has a bit of a nasal voice. And more so, his hair. <laughs> <laughs> There's places where he doesn't tie it up like it would have been appropriate, you know, in the, in the, men had long hair, but they usually put it in a ponytail. He just, some men can pull off long hair, Miranda can't. And to, to his credit, I noticed that in a later, in a later picture, he's cut it short. Good for him. Uh, there's some uh, clever rhymes that are a little too clever, like Burr and Sir, which, which I found a little annoying and cringy at at parks. That was in the first act, of course, when he first meets Aaron Burr, who is at first his friend before they become bitter enemies. There's a couple of numbers in the second act. Part, part of the second act is kind of slow and somber, and which I guess, you know, I guess that's kind of required by the by the events. You know, Hamilton, Hamilton is on the outs with his wife because of the affair, and then suddenly the son dies. Um, to kind of summarize, although I know that uh, that Lin Manuel Miranda's politics are very different than mine, and that I think he's very pro-immigration, and I believe it needs to be restricted. And I'm sure we differ on a lot of other uh, a lot of other topics, but nonetheless, I found it to be a patriotic show that really inspires me to uh, work more for the causes that I believe in. So thank you, Lin Manuel, for that for that inspiration. Uh, but the most inspiring, moving thing about this show, I thought, was how it reminds us of the uh, of our heritage and what we've lost in terms of unity in this very, very, very divided and ac acrimonious atmosphere we find ourselves in right now. It's really sad, and that's part of what made me so uh, choked up when hearing. Washington's farewell address song <laughs> because we don't need it doesn't need to be this way we don't need to hate each other and I feel that you know we need more works like Hamilton which can bring us together instead of pushing us apart um, by politics by race and uh, by income of course because the uh, the billionaires have have gotten a have made even richer, have made themselves even richer over the last few years. So I really would like to see more unifying, uh, unifying works. As a rating, I would give it in my steampunk desperado rating, rating standard, I would give it five out of five gears. Highly recommended. So thanks for bearing with me on my rather rather random uh, rather ma random state of mind expostulation on the Lin-Manuel Miranda's musical Hamilton. And please give your comments below. Please let me know what you think. And also please like and subscribe so that we can continue to grow this channel as I get back into doing videos. And for now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, Adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.